Okay, so today we are going to talk about uh, masculinities and violence. And um, this is a, the first of a three um, different focuses relating to violence and gender. The first being masculinities and violence. The second being um, uh, intimate violence. And the third being uh, sexual violence. But, and the, the common theme for, for these three um, focuses is the, the interesting ways in which violence is linked to gender. Um, and there are a few things we know um, and that are really, really important in the project of addressing violence. Um, and one of the, the most illuminating approaches to violence of the last few decades has, have been um, approaches that, that, that ask questions about the, the gendered nature of violence, both in terms of the kinds of violence, the perpetrators of violence, and the victims of violence. Um, and a couple of things are, are, are well known and have been well researched and seem to be pretty consistent across different um, cultures and societies. Um, and these are the fact that, that men tend to be the main perpetrators of physical violence. Um, but not only that, as soon as we look at that claim, we also need to think about the fact that men are also the main victims um, of, of most forms of violence. And the emphasis then the most, which, which is different from saying all forms of violence, because there's some forms of violence that are m much more directed towards women. But men are the main perpetrators, men are the main victims, but they are also um, more likely to be harmed in other ways that we don't normally think of, of, of as violent. They're much more likely to die by suicide, um, and they're much more likely to die earlier from other causes, um, causes like exposure to um, risky um, work conditions, um, causes such as stress-related health conditions, um, and, and we need to understand all of these things. We need to understand um, men as both being a risk to um, the societies they exist in um, because of their greater chance of them being violent offenders. But we also need to understand the way in which masculinity functions as a risk to men. Um, and this is why um, we're going to talk about masculinities rather than men. And it's very important to distinguish between those concepts. Um, and so um, as opposed to claims um, that, 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 that take the notion of men as their foundation, like all men are bastards, um, we're not really interested in that kind of claim so much as claims about different masculinities and how they come into existence and the effects they have. One of the other things that's really interesting when we start studying uh, masculinities is that in as much as, as, as men are linked to higher levels of violence, there's a strong age-related correlation here. It's not simply um, men in general, it's particularly young men that are linked to violence. Um, and we see interesting patterns here that it tends to rise around the age of 14, 15, get really high into the late teens and early 20 years, and then sort of 25 to 27, it starts tapering off and being much lower. So that's quite interesting, is that, that, that it's not just that men are violent, they're violent at a particular time in their lives often. Um, and interestingly, it's the time in their lives where they are establishing their masculinity the time of their lives where they're moving from childhood into um, early adult masculinity. Um, and that later, once they move into sort of established um, adult ma masculinity, that violence seems to taper off a little bit. So that's interesting to think about. Okay. But as we're saying, we're talking about masculinities, not about this kind of monolithic category of men that all, all people are of a certain biological sexual differentiation we're not we're not that that's that's not our focus and it's important that's not not our focus um um precisely because there is there's another story that has been told about the relation between masculinity and violence um <clears throat> and that story is a kind of socio-biological story it's a it's a version of a biological determinism and a version of kind of evolutionary explanation 
um, for social behavior. And it goes like this, um, because, and it assumes, firstly, that there are two genders, men, um, uh, or the two sexes, men and women. Uh, and the difference between them essentially is that women can give birth to children and men can't. Um, and taking that as its kind of biological basis, it says because of that, um, for the survival and reproduction of the species, what has happened is men, uh, women have had the, the job of raising children um, they give birth to them, they look after them, and men have had the job of making sure that the rest of the provisions for the community are there. So they have had to go out and do the hunting um, and bringing home dead animals to eat and things like that. Um, and it's an interesting story. I mean, it sounds on the surface of it relatively plausible, and it certainly seems that um, th that, that may have been the basis for some of the um, origins of gender differences um, is, is, is the, the, the biological link to, to reproduction and why sort of the private domestic spaces are associated with femininity and, and sort of public and workspaces have been associated with masculinity. Um, however, as an attempt to sort of generate a causal um, account of the link between, um, between men and violence, it fails on a number of measures. Um, and the first and most important measure it, it fails on is it, it simply doesn't account properly for differences in masculinities, for, for, the, for the fact that there are major differences between individual men in, the, in every society and the major differences between the forms of masculinity that are dominant in different societies. And that these differences, the differences between individual men and the differences between masculinities in different societies are, are, are greater than any sort of general statistical difference between the genders, okay? Um, and that's what we need to explain. We need to, we need, we need to explain these, these, these differences. Um, and it's important because the, one of the risks of that sociobiological explanation, the kind of like, oh, men are genetically programmed to be violent and dominant and to kill animals and rip the bare flesh off with their teeth and eat it. Um, one of the problems with that is that it assumes that given that these things are, you know, in some hypothetical way kind of genetically programmed, that it's, they just are what they are. And trying to tinker with them on a social level is doomed to failure because you're trying to, you're trying to do social engineering against the kind of brute fatalism of genetics. Um, and one of the things we know is that, well, that's just false because we have tinkered in very interesting social engineering ways in the last 50 years, and many of them have been incredibly effective. Um, and so that's, an, that's another point where, where that, that kind of um, um, particular theoretical orientation has proven to be um, substantially weak. Um, so when we start looking at masculinities then, um, we, need, we, we need to raise the question of, well, well how are masculinities produced and, and what forms do they take? Um, and so we're looking at this question of masculine norms and violence, okay? And the particular article that you're looking at there on masculine norms and violence um, identifies a number of, of, of key issues. Firstly, um, that there is, that they, they, the societies create this kind of pressure on men to achieve a socially accepted, socially valued form of manhood that is particular to, to, to that social group in society. And that this is an ongoing process. The process of, of producing one's masculinity for, for oneself and for others to see is 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 a really um, is a really complex process, and interestingly, it's a process that is that is very violently policed. Um, so the second big issue there is that this is that masculine that, that, that kind of masculine identity is 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 policed. It is rewarded and punished, um, and so um, boys sort of entering into masculine ro roles find that they're under constant kind of evaluation. 
as to whether they are meeting the dominant norms of masculinity. Um, and when they fail to meet those, they are generally punished and punished often very violently. Um, and you remember, we discussed this already when we were talking about bullying and we looked at that school bullying example. And, and we understood in that analysis how clear it was that the reason the bullying was being tolerated was that it was, it was, it was actually designed to produce a certain kind of, of masculinity. It was designed to produce um, violent, abusive, dominant men and to punish men that showed any characteristics that were considered feminine. Um, that were considered gentle or um, emotionally expressive or sensitive or anything like that. And they were actually physically brutalized for, for showing those qualities. And this links us up to the, to the next point um, uh, in that analysis, is, that, is, 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 is what is referred to as the, as the gendering of emotion, okay? That certain emotions are seen as being good and proper for men and certain emotions are seen good and, and proper for women. And, 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 there's a, and there's a strong set of social pressures um, to force those um, on men and women. And it's interesting um, because this is another point at which the kind of sociobiological argument breaks down. Because if these things were just expressions of, of you know, the evolutionary programming of people's genes, there wouldn't be a need to police them. I mean, they would just happen by themselves. There wouldn't be a, a need to, to humiliate and assault effeminate men or to, 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 to mock masculine girls. Um, you know, that, that, that stuff would, would just happen by itself and society wouldn't be need to be aggressively intervening to ensure that certain masculinities were rewarded and others were punished. But this gendering of emotion Okay, um, the, the allocation of certain em emotions to men. So men are allowed to be assertive, aggressive, dominant, um, emotionally invulnerable, um, uh, and what they're not allowed to be are all the things that are associated with femininity. They're not allowed to be sensitive, gentle, caring, um, and, and those things are then uh, mocked and physically punished. Um, in this kind of cultural policing of masculine performance. Um, the other factor that is identified, there's a notion of gender um, uh, divisions um, of, of, of not only of sort of gender, of, of social roles, but of also social spaces, okay? And the, and the idea that masculine spaces should be associated with power dominance um, in, in, all, in, in, in all different spheres, whether those are kind of senior positions in, um, in work environments, uh, senior um, uh, leading positions in, in kind of political power, um, and certainly in, in situations of kind of military power and other spaces of aggression. And so, um, you know, we see the extent to which things like, for instance, policing are historically masculine spaces. And in um, those, those images of police brutality, I mean, it's, it's really interesting looking at um, the way in which the, the police involved in those moments just always seem to be men. But what's also interesting is how often their victims are also men. And so we start noticing that this, this violence is actually violence between men. Um, and we saw that right back in uh, City of God. Remember, we were looking at those um, Brazilian um, gangs and the extent to which that wasn't just a story about gangs, it wasn't just a story about social inequality, it was a story about masculinity. It was a story about, about socially marginalized men trying to kind of make it in terms of certain male roles, trying to make it um, economically, trying to make it in terms of social status and, and their pathway, their specifically gendered pathway to those things was through exercising violence, um, through becoming involved with um, criminal gangs uh, and those gangs being extremely brutal. Um, and so we, we were already seeing this, 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 um, this link between, um, between masculinity and aggression and, and violence occurring there. Um, and another uh, feature of the, the sort of masculine uh, norms is, is the question of patriarchal power. 
Um, and the fact that these, these, these roles don't just differentiate kind of psychological qualities, you know, different emotional um, sort of qualities to, to, to men and women and then try and police those. They also allocate um, gender groups different power in society. And so that there are, there, there, there are a set of rewards for conforming to the, the gender roles. Um, and for men, the um, very simple things like the, 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 the inequitable um, earning power that, that men tend to have higher salaries in the workplace, they tend to more easily enter a whole lot of professions. Um, except, of course, where those professions are um, identified as caring professions or, or, or professions that are linked to the well-being of children. There, often women are, are preferred. Um, but we see this, that the, the, the process of masculine norms is also sort of organized in terms of the process of the unequal distribution of, of power and opportunities and assets in society. Um, so in thinking about this, um, where does this take us? Understanding those pressures that are placed on people, those ways in which society kind of uh, puts a lot of effort into, into kind of gendering identity. Um, um, firstly, we need to go beyond this assumption that we rejected earlier, that violence is somehow innate for men, that it's somehow normal for men. It's an expression of just what it, what it means to belong to that particular biological cl classification. And to, to, to think in a more subtle and more differentiated way about the way in which men and women resist violence. Because even within these systems, the systems are always breaking down. I mean, within that school bullying story, what was interesting is that system was breaking down, that 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 mothers were saying no we not we don't want our sons to experience this and 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 other people were looking on and being shocked and saying this has to stop um so 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 there's a constant kind of um resistance to those to the policing of those gender norms um in looking at that, we can also understand that the masculine gender norms aren't just there, that they, that they are imposed and reinforced in very specific ways. There's very specific kind of beliefs, very specific social practices, where even very specific phrases like, uh, you know, like the, and, and um, Jackson Katz really explores this in great depth. Um, in 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 his work um and in that video tough guys like look looks at the the way in which the media especially really kind of constructs and imposes gender stereotypes um and so these phrases like be a man um, um boys don't cry don't go running to mommy like these these sort of cultural little hooks that um that's that 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 serve to impose and reinforce um the the construction of masculine gender are, are, are very, very powerful. Um, and, and we need to analyze and, and understand those and look at how they are implemented in exactly the way that Katz does in that Tough Guys video. The other thing is we need to look at um, the way in which these are not just, um, as we said, these are not just sort of gender differentiations. They, they, they're related to stru social structures of gender inequality. And so there's a, there's a very careful system of rewarding certain kinds of gender identities um, and, and punishing others. Um, and we need to look at the way in which that functions. Um, an, important, an important place to get into this analysis is to look at the experiences of, of survivors of the violence of that gendering system. So not only survivors of, of masculine violence um, in terms of the groups that are vulnerable, the women, children, gender minorities that are vulnerable to being violently victimized by, um, by masculine violence, but also the, the ways in which um, men uh, are survivors of masculine violence, the way in which both the both the um, humiliation and violence of, of the gender policing of their own identities, but also the way in which they then get caught up in, in, in other things, that they get caught up in 
um, systems like you know get being being allocated into risky life positions, being end up you know being in 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 dangerous professions, end up being exposed to toxic levels of stress that impact on their their mental and phys physical health, end up um, having shorter life expectancy. Um, end up themselves being victims of other men's violence so we need we need to we need to explore from that standpoint um but most of all this analysis really indicates to us that it's not just the individual differences which often sort of uh, more psychological approaches um to violence take um you know the idea of oh well that that serial killer is a you know that they are they have a mental health issue they are a psychopath or um whatever personal attribution is made that they are that that's a response to the, the 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 thing that is wrong with that specific individual um and and it's important to look at that but it's also important to and to recognize that there are patterns to these things you know, it's the, there's patterns to the fact that almost um, that most kind of serial killers and mass murderers are men. Um, and part of that pattern is their individual experience. But part of that pattern is, is, is the social construction of their masculinity and how those two things actually contribute towards each other. That the, the social constructions of masculinities actually create experiences and identities for individual people. Um, and this, this has led to some of the most um, effective and interesting work in the field of violence protection, which is working um, uh, on, on violence reduction through gender transformative approaches to, to actually actively working with masculinities um, and to, to sort of critically learn to kind of dismantle um, harmful and toxic masculinities and create other options um, to explore the, 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 the options that um, already widely exist and are practiced of, of, um, of um, alternatives to those very dangerous um, and violent forms of masculinity. And another part of it is also recognizing that part of the toxicity of, of those masculinities is the ways in which boys and men can't seek help. The ways in which when, when young boys are bullied, they are encouraged to just go and fight back, to not, not show vulnerability, not seek help. And then how that gets played on in, out in later life, how men struggle to seek help with their, with their emotional crises. And this leads them to, to serious problems of, of you know, psychological trauma that remains untreated, um, depression and a huge risk of suicide for men, um, and so an important part of it is to to create create these supportive spaces. And what's interesting is that they they often neglected spaces, and so we see um, just in, in one example that men who, for instance, are victims of um, intimate partner violence or victims of sexual assault find it very very hard to seek help around those things it's it's um it's it for 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 you know the assumption that oh, if they just went to the cops and reported offense like what what would they expect to happen uh if they told a couple of other male officers that they were being abused by their their female um romantic partner partner or that they had been sexually assaulted um, and often the, the, the real challenges in help seeking and expressing those um, crises and moments of vulnerability um, actually places men at um, even greater risk, not only of negative outcomes to themselves, but of also that sort of creating um, a set of emotions and behaviors that, that then might lead them to offending and being violent in other ways. Okay, so we're moving on to the um, Kaufman article um, or, or the Kaufman, Kaufman's theory on the seven P's of men's violence. And, and he tries to sort of simplify the question of the you know, relation between masculinity and violence by, by you know, by, by um, using this idea of, of, of 
getting all the all the concepts to start with the letter p and it's a little bit forced in some critical moments but but it's a it's it's a nice way of 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 giving us a kind of like a conceptual framework and um and probably the first p um comes from the idea of patriarchal power that 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 we can't understand masculinity and violence without understanding the the orga the gendered organization of power in society that 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 one of the things that that traditional gendering has done is it has created certain advantages for men uh, and we've already discussed that we've already discussed the the the, the social powers the economic opportunities um uh the 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 rights to occupy social spaces, all those kinds of things that that are that um, are linked to masculine um, uh, that that framework of masculinities and the way in which women are excluded from a whole lot of of opportunities and spaces and and um, although there've been great gains made in that and certainly um, in societies like this we no longer have the things that existed until quite recently historically um, of women not being allowed to vote, women not being allowed to go to university, women not being allowed into professions, women not being allowed to have leadership positions um, in, the, in um, the work world, in the economy, in politics, um, that many of those have gradually changed to some extent, none of them have completely disappeared, um, but, the, but, but the fundamental structure of the system seems to be remarkably resilient. And linked to that is uh, uh, the second P, which is the notion of privilege, which is a sense of entitlement. And this becomes really interesting. There's a lot of work being done on, on entitled masculinities. And, um, and certainly um, at, uh, later on, we're gonna look at the, the particular case of Elliot Roger and why that is being talked about so much in terms of entitlement. Um, and um, one of the things um, that uh, is linked to entitlement that we'll talk about later is often gendered violence, that one of the forms of entitlement, not only in being entitled to privilege, respect, but also being entitled to certain kinds of behaviors, certain kinds of sexual behaviors, and to, to um, being allowed to become violent um, when, those when when those those sorts of um, privileges are refused. So, for instance, the way in which men often become violent when they are sort of attempting to flirt or attempting to advance sexually, um, and 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 the, and 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 their sense of it, their entitlement to do that to 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 enter someone else's space to require that person to re, to respond to them in a certain uh, way and when and 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 when that is um, turned down, we often see this kind of entitlement shift into its violent face uh, in terms of retaliation. But we'll talk about that later. Linked to that, of course, is the notion of permission. Okay, it's not d d just a sense of entitlement. That linked to that entitlement, that men are permitted to be violent. That that a certain amount of violence is 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 okay. That you know, like young boys are allowed to fight. Um, to be physically rough, a certain amount of 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 masculine aggression is is not only tolerated but rewarded, um, and we see even sort of masculine political leaders, you know, talking in violent and aggressive ways, um, trying to humiliate their opponents, trying to assert a kind of a, themselves as as tough um, and particularly as comes out on kind of toughness against minorities, like being anti-immigrant or anti-gender minorities or tough on crime. Uh, um, and and these, these, these forms of male aggression, they're not necessarily physical acts of violence, but sort of performances of hostility and dominance um, against uh, minorities and vulnerable groups. Um, but, in looking at all of that, it, it makes it sound like like men are really just having a great time of this privilege, um, permission, and power. But the paradox, which is the fourth P, is that all of this stuff actually really ends up harming men. 
um, that it actually creates all these problems we talked about, makes them more likely to be victims of violence, makes them more likely to suffer other negative um, physical and mental health consequences. Um, and so the men are really actually harmed by, um, by those constructions of, of aggressive masculinity and dominant masculinity. Um, so that that brings us to the kind of understanding of well, how does that work? How does the these sort of social ideas of masculinity play out in the kind of individual emotional development of of um, of men? And so the fifth P there is the notion of the psych of psychic armor. Okay, that means the, the kind of emotional self defense that men have to put on this kind of image of toughness. And that means that what they have to they have to negate and erase and deny the things that don't fit with that the 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 vulnerability the feelings of empathy all those 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 really positive qualities that actually make um, kind of people being together so valuable um, the capacity to care and be cared for to be kind and gentle to to help others and feel understood. Um, that 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 this kind of forms of toxic masculinity um, in 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 a very kind of literal way often sort of beat that out of men, and and so they lose um, a lot of of you know what what the what what could both be the value and joy of 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 of, of being a human being in a social world. And this leads to the sixth P, which is the notion of the psychic pressure cooker, which, which is just simply meaning that, that these emotions then build up, that the fact that the, 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 the complicated um, emotions are not allowed to be expressed, but the ones that are allowed to be expressed, the rage and the dominance, um, um, are, are then also a part of that mix, and that and this builds up into potentially explosive situations. So, so we often find that masculine violence is not that sort of calculating um, the violence, the violence of you know a planned armed robbery or something. It's the violence of someone losing their temper, it's the violence of someone feeling that someone has done something to them, that someone has. Has 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 humiliated or hurt them in some way. Someone has made them feel jealous or may, or 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 made 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 them feel degraded, um, and and that and 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 that becomes those emotions become unmanageable and expressive, and at that moment they erupt in acts of violence um, because that is that is the the thing that has been tolerated and the thing that has been encouraged in the formation of that masculinity. Um, and the final P is, is um, that Kaufman points to is the necessary necessity of looking at past experiences. That 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 these are these are things that happen in a context, um, and often it's precisely the experience of being in a violent environment, of seeing violence being normalized, of being a victim of violence, and that's why we focused on that in the in that analysis of the school bullying. We really saw. The young boys at that transition into adolescence, um, not only being forced into an environment that normalised um, older boys being violent, but but they but they actually experienced that violence against themselves. And not only did they experience that violence against themselves, if they if they showed any kind of appropriate response to that, if they showed the 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 feelings of vulnerability. Um, they were further punished for that. So this importance of, of looking at the way in which these toxic masculinities are, are actually constructed out of very specific social experiences and that, and that work needs to be done there, looking at the way in which uh, the, the violent and abusive way in which, in which um, boys are, are, are forced into um, those destructive masculinities. Um, okay, then moving from the seven P's of masculine violence to a number of different focuses um, that have been explored. Um, the notion um, that, that certain of the major kinds of violence that exist in society are, are much more strongly linked to masculinity um, 
than to femininity. Um, and one of the ones that people um, have been focusing on more and more recently is violence against children. Um, and it's interesting. Um, um, and we've talked about the, the question of violence against children already, is that once again, it happens in a context and it happens in a set of intersecting um, processes. It's not, it's not just a simple thing. There are these particular men who are violent towards children. Firstly, there's the, the, that it hap violence against children happens within systems of structural inequalities. It happens um, where there are vulnerabilities where there there where there are, are neither social resources for for supportive child care nor positive masculine models for positive child care um, and um, it it also but it also depends not only on the kind of socio on, on the kind of economic um, aspects of of the absence of positive child care but also the the, the social and cultural norms and the fact that certain forms of violence um, against children are tolerated. And remember, that's why we focused on the question of corporal punishment, the fact that, that in fact people tolerate certain kinds of violence against children. But what's interesting, what came out in that one very detailed analysis, which said, look, wait a minute, it's not just that people are for against corporal punishment, they tolerate certain kinds of corporal punishment and not others. And one of the big factors there was that they are much more okay with boys being hit than with girls being hit. That, um, that 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 kind of corporal punishment violence against children is 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 often very gendered and very gendered um, in terms of the justifications that are offered for violence against boys um, and then of course there's the, there's the kind of gender norms which have been discussing all along of the this idea of raising boys to be to, to not show emotional vulnerability, to show toughness, to show aggression, to show dominance. Um, and that this, this is both done through um, modeling violence for them and violence against them and punishing the masculinities that don't fit into, into that form of violence. Um, and one of the things I very, very strongly recommend you look at here um, is the, um, the Netflix film, Won't You Be My Neighbor, which is a really interesting um, exploration of alternatives to the sort of toxic um, socialization of children, um, which we will discuss again later in the course. Um, of course, linked to that is the question of child sexual abuse, which people are very concerned about. And it's interesting because they're so concerned about it that it also leads to these kind of deranged conspiracy theories. And, and so you get this kind of QAnon, Pizzagate kind of like lunacy circulating on the internet. There's no relation to reality, um, but it's built on a very, very serious problem that, 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 that is kind of a core issue is the sexual abuse of children. And that's, remember why we focused on those cases um, and looking at um, films like Deliver Us From Evil, um, the, 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 the fact that there's a serious problem of sexual violence against children. But what's interesting about this is not only that men are by far the most common perpetrators, they're not, um, and they're not ex the only perpetrators, but they're by far the most common perpetrators of violence against children, but also that they are very likely to be the victims. And there's, there've been some studies, um, different studies in different parts of the world have, have identified differently, but, but they either about half as likely or just as likely to be victims of sexual violence up until about the age of 15 as girls are. So, so in some countries, it's actually the, the, the levels of, of sexual violence against boys and girls is, 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 absolute, is pretty much statistically the same until they become teenagers. In other countries, it's about a two to one imbalance and girls are more likely to be victimized. Um, but what's interesting is that the men who sexually abuse children are often not what we think of as pedophiles. Um, and we, we, we've talked before about, we have this kind of picture of a pedophile, of this sort of kind of person like, you know, wearing an overcoat, standing outside playgrounds or whatever. Um, and, but essentially a person who has a, who has a, 
who has a sexual desire for children, not for adult partners, that, they, they, that they're driven by a, the, the fact that they don't feel sexual desire towards um, their own peers, and they do feel sexual desire towards um, underage children. Um, but what's interesting is a lot of sexual abuse is not committed by pedophiles. It's committed simply because children are vulnerable, simply because men have access to children and that those children are taught to be acquiescent and compliant and to, and if they're told to shut up, then they will shut up. Um, they easily threaten, they easily exploited. And so we often see that um, sexual violence against children is opportunistic rather than preferential. Um, and that in most cases, the offenders are known to the victims. In most cases, it's precisely not some sort of stranger. It is, uh, it is an extended family member. It is a member from the faith-based organization. It can be someone in the school or in a care facility. Um, um, and so there is that complication, but also the fact that um, offenders are, are um, more likely to have been victims themselves. And, and, and that we've talked before about needing to understand the cycle of violence, of why people who've been sexually abused are, don't necessarily become sexual abusers themselves, but they are more likely um, to be involved with that sort of um, activity. Um, other work has also clearly shown that it's linked to, to other, other sort of clusters of behavior, antisocial um, sort of personality, antisocial behavior, um, that it's linked to um, context in which there are, are gender norms that sort of positively associate masculinity with sexual activity and with sexual dominance. And of course, there is a problem of of organized sexual trafficking, although currently that seems to have been sort of almost insanely misrepresented um, in these weird conspiracy theories. And the danger of those conspiracy theories is precisely that they, they make it more difficult to, to, to identify what is actually real and the actual risks that, that are being faced. Um, but but one of the big links is, with masculinity is the is the question of homicide. Okay, the question of murder. Um, the you know one of the the most serious um, crimes that we we really need to think about and solve. Um, and the fact that men are much more likely to be the ones who commit murder. And this is even more true with mass murders. It's even more true. We see with the school shootings and other forms of mass murders that these are these are these are really kind of masculine projects most of the time. Um, but not only are men more likely to be the perpetrators of homicide, they're much more likely to be victims of homicide. Men get 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 murdered much more than women, um, and those differences vary internationally, but it's very very consistent. Um, uh, that there's that 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 men are much more likely to be to be murdered, um, and what's interesting is when it happens. And um, sociologists often call these kind of situations honor context, which essentially fights. Um, they essentially happen when when men get into a situation where they where they feel like they're defending their status or dignity against each other. They feel like someone you know, bumped them and didn't apologize or, some, or someone uh, used a, 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 a turn of phrase, particularly an feminizing turn of phrase, which they find offensive. And so they have to defend themselves. And it's, uh, so the defense of masculine status becomes the kind of the trigger point, the flashpoint in these escalations of conflict that often um, lead to violence and or death. Um, the other thing that Kaufman refers us to is, an, is, is the notion of aggrieved entitlement, that the idea of believing that that masculinity gives one the right to something. And then when you don't get the thing that you feel you have the right to, then, then it's appropriate to use violence to regain that thing. And we can talk about that, particularly in the Elliot Roger video, um, looking at Elliot Roger and his experience of aggrieved entitlement. Um, but these these factors 
really link up very closely with the next reading we're going to look at, which is James Gilligan's work on, on male prisoners and the, the issue of shame, the connection between masculinity and shame. Okay, so, so James Gilligan is a psychiatrist who works in the um, prison system in the United States. And what he, he worked with the most serious repeat violent offenders, um, and specifically male offenders. Um, and he was really interested in why not only did they end up in prison because they were violent, but once they were in prison, they would continue being violent, even though they knew they would be seriously punished, that they'd be put in solitary confinement, that they'd get their sentence, that they would be denied parole. And often when they were released back into society, they would become violent again. So it, it just, it, it, to him, it was like, what's going wrong? These men carry on being violent. The deterrence doesn't seem to work for them. Um, and, and what can be done about that? And what he noticed is the, the extent to which their violent outbursts were linked to a very common experience, and it was the experience of feeling disrespected, the experience of being dissed by someone, the experience of feeling like that something was going on with the people around them, that they were being humiliated. Um, and that this led to explosive retaliation. And part of that explosive retaliation is that the consequences weren't being considered, is that they would just, they would just become enraged and become physically violent, regardless of the fact that there were prison guards watching, that they would definitely get punished, or that they may very well get killed if they injured a prisoner from another gang. I mean, that they, there would be a price to pay for that. Um, and, and so what Gilligan really concluded is that for these men, there's a threat to their sense of self. Their threat, there was much more serious than a threat to their, their physical survival. So the, the threat of, of being injured or killed was insignificant to them compared to a threat to their dignity, their, 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 their sense of who they are. And so it was really these feelings of shame and humiliation, which were absolutely catastrophic for these men. That's what was intolerable. You know, being injured, being killed, being put in solitary confinement, having their sentence extended, that wasn't the threat. The threat was this absolutely intolerable feeling of, of shame and humiliation. Um, and, that, and that essentially they were defending themselves against these feelings through their aggression. Um, and, and of course, in our analysis, we've already shown so clearly that it's precisely feelings of vulnerability that, that within those toxic masculinities are the ones that can't be managed, the ones that are intolerable. And so that, so that Gilligan really clearly sees these outbursts of interpersonal violence in re reaction to feeling disrespected as being ways of, 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 of trying to, to respond to these unmanageable um, experiences of, of emotional vulnerability and particularly the vulnerability of, of feeling humiliation, feeling rejection, feeling shame. Um, and that this is the, the, the big link to violence. And certainly we see that happening in a lot of masculine violence. We see it happening in intimate relationships. We see it happening in social interactions between men. Um, and we see that happening even with those, uh, those mass murderers, the school shooters um, talking, you know, we see the Columbine kids, you know, having been bullied. Um, we see Elliot Roger talking about feeling rejected by, by, by a woman he was attracted to. Um, and this, this seems to be a very, very powerful factor at work um, in the, the construction of, of, of dangerous masculinities. Okay, but in conclusion, looking at this, we must remember that we, we, we're talking about masculinities rather than men, and there's no simple correlation between a kind of biological category of being a man and participating in, in these, these specifically violent and destructive masculinities. And this is precisely why the term toxic masculinity has come into currency, to separate toxic masculinity from other masculinities and other gender identities, to say that there's not a simple correlation, that, that in fact the toxicity, that, that toxicity varies 
across different masculinities and across different gender identities. Um, and that notion of men doesn't really get at the heart of these, of these, of these different gender constructions. And that they, the different gender constructions depend on cultural context, on social context, and on individual identifications. That some societies really reward aggressive masculinity, others don't. And in, the, and, and in the former societies, we see very high levels, not only of men being aggressive, but men also being victims of violence and also suffering these other negative outcomes. The, the more likely to be injured and, and killed at work, more likely to suffer early death from stress-related medical conditions, more likely um, to become suicidal. Um, and so we need to look at those differences um, in, in masculinities and the fact that, that, that not all societies create equally kind of gender polarized and toxic masculinities, but not all, not all men identify with the more toxic forms of masculinity and that there are other aspects of masculinity. There are, there, 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 one, there, there are other positive qualities that are linked to masculinities like like, like responsibility, like caring for family. And so we see interesting shifts there. It's not a simple, like, you know, correlation between masculinity, toxicity, and violence. Um, and we see uh, also a huge change in the last generation towards accepting um, men in openly kind of caring roles, you know, being emotionally supportive with their children, um, work, um, critiquing uh, toxic forms of masculinity, accepting gender differences. Um, and here, once again, I refer you to the movie that we, I want us to look at in more depth, which is the um, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Um, and the recognition then that those, those, those toxic masculinities not only make men who get drawn into them or not so much drawn into them as forced into them, they actually get bullied and beaten into identification with toxic masculinities. Um, it not only makes them a risk to society, it makes them a risk to themselves. That those, the masculinities are toxic for the very men who, who end up identifying with them, um, not only for the, the, the people around them. But the important thing in all of this, and, 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 and this is why this analysis is really worth doing, is because what we're showing is that those masculinities are constructed. And if they're constructed, they can be deconstructed and reconstructed. And this is, you remember, you know, what we keep saying at Gilligan said, we, 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 you know, we've, and, and as much as we've got to have, we have a theory of violence, we've got to know our theory of violence so that we can think about whether it's correct or not. We, we need to know our gender. We need to know our gender roles. We need to know what, 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 what masculinities have we created? Um, the ones that we don't notice because we've normalized them. We need to step back from them and say, wait a minute, what is the masculinity we've been taught is valuable? And what does that masculinity do? Who does it advantage? Who does it disadvantage? Who does it put at risk? In what ways does it put them at risk? Because sometimes the people that it's appearing to put in, give advantages to are actually also being put at risk by it. So, so that's the important thing, that, that, that we, we, we look at the construction of toxic masculinities precisely because that means there's, there's real opportunity for, for, for alternatives. There's, there's real opportunity for other kinds of gender formations, for other senses of self, for other ways of um, relating to people and to one's own emotions that don't have to be shaped by that. Um, and that is the real positive outcome of this analysis.